a very warm welcome to tonight's guest, Jonathan Mews from C Prime, who joins us tonight from the East Coast of the United States. And with that, Jonathan, over to you and over to how you solve our migration worries with Kavia. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes. Uh... As mentioned, um, with C Prime, I am the product manager for uh, our Atlassian applications. I've been automating Jira for more time than I want to admit. Um, let's talk about some of the apps that I use to uh, help repair migrations because within C Prime, I am one of the people that get called when there's an emergency with a migration. Um, and, and we need to fix things posthumously uh, after the fact. Perhaps there's no time to go back and, and redo the migration because uh, you know, it's already been announced to the company and they've already gone live. Um, that's where I kind of step in and, and clean things up. So I use uh, what's known as the power suite of apps. Um, there are many applications within the, the power suite and they are all built on a common platform and that platform is the scripting language underneath and that scripting language is incredibly simplified compared to groovy or or python or other languages you can use to automate jira but it is just as powerful um, and and that just buys you a lot of benefits including uh, speed, uh, simplicity, it's an extensible ecosystem, and the same code you use uh, on, on server can also be used in cloud, and the same code you use on Jira 6 can be used on Jira 8, uh, and that's all uh, a benefit to the, to the platform that we use. And we all know the benefits of automation. Uh, automation uh, just helps you scale intelligently. And <laughs> Today I'm going to talk to you about a system uh, I invented just for this webinar called called Caviar. And Caviar uh, are a lot of the same elements that uh, you would do in a migration because it's common sense, but it's how automation can play into those those steps. Uh, for example, let's talk about the the first step, which is communicate communication. Now, obviously, the number one method for uh, communicating that a migration is about to occur is going to be through a, a mass email or, or an email blast. Um, and, and automation really doesn't need to have uh, a play with this. But um, while sending those email blasts, be sure not to just tell users that the migration is going to happen, but be sure to explain to them uh, why they're migrating, when they're migrating, what they can expect out of a result of the migration, and who to contact with questions. Uh, that's just good common practice. However, and I am very guilty of this, uh, emails are not always effective. They're not always going to, to reach people because um, it, they rely on the fact that somebody opens the email and reads the email. And like me, there's many people that read maybe the first sentence and then do not con continue reading the rest of the email. So you need to account for that in, in some way uh, with the migration. So, uh, and, and that's just internal users of Jira, but there's also external users of Jira, such as customers. And, you know, customers especially aren't going to uh, open and read every single email that, that comes from a, a vendor or a partner or somebody they're working with. Um, in fact, they're, they're say, more likely not to read those. So you need to be able to kind of pick up the pieces uh, uh, where the email communication can, can fall short. And one way that I'd like to do that is to, is to leave the old system up for a little while. Um, you know, we're talking days or weeks. Um, it really depends on your users and, and, and how long it takes them between sessions 
you know, uh, where they where they don't use Jira for a little while to come back. Um, but leaving it up is a, is a good practice. Now you don't necessarily want to allow them to use Jira, um, but give them a place to go and not just run into a dead end. Uh, so you can restrict access to all the projects, just remove permissions from the permission schemes. But then in the announcement banner, you can give them a message and a link telling them what's happened and what they need to do. And the beautiful part about the announcement banner is that this can be done uh, before they even log in. So the very first page they hit uh, on the old instance, they, they can be given an explanation. Uh, now, this is where automation can come into play, uh, targeted messages. So the problem with the announcement banner is it's going to be one message for everybody. I'm sorry for the background noise, if you can hear that. Um, so that's not the worst for JIRA, but for Confluence, that may not be the, the, the best, especially if somebody's coming in uh, looking for a knowledge base article or tutorial or a documentation, and instead they're just taken to this enormous Confluence instance um, where they would have to then search for that, where they may or may not find it, may not be the best. So targeted messages um, can, can really help you with that. So uh, some examples of targeted messages, and these are, are examples that I'm actually using for my own migration that I'm actually going through right now. Um, <clears throat> We have external Jira service desk portals for our, our clients. And what I'm planning on doing is being able to redirect them directly to the exact same service desk portal on the cloud. And we have um, articles and tutorials that we publish in the uh, Alaskan community. And when they follow the link to the old article, I'm just going to redirect them right to the new article. And that, that is going to take work, but uh, it provides a seamless transition. Um, and again, it, it only works as long as you leave the old system up, which we can afford to do for you know, maybe a year. Um, but targeted messages and, and targeted actions uh, can, can really help fill in those pieces. All right, so the next uh, step of caviar, which is the A, is, is analyze. And this is important because you need to know what you're migrating. Uh, you need to know what constitutes a successful migration. And you need to be able to alleviate any uh, challenges or roadblocks to that migration. And in order to do that, you, you need to understand what those are. Uh, so the way you would do this is collect data about your system. Some good basic data to collect just to know that everything got migrated would be, you know, the, the number of projects and issues and users and groups and, and all these other things. Um, just to know that everything made it over, made it over to the new system. Uh, but there's also some uh, additional metrics that you might want to consider, such as uh, the date of the the most recent uh, update to a project. You know, maybe that project hasn't been used in three years. Uh, maybe you can just um, archive these projects and, and not migrate them. And, um, you know, the less you migrate, the less things that can go wrong. I mean, uh, a lot of people are afraid of making changes prior to migration, but you're making a tremendous change as is by, by migrating. Um, and why not alleviate all the problems you can up front if possible? Uh, so another one is users last login date. So you know, maybe you're migrating users that haven't uh, logged in for uh, you know, a year. And it's okay for Jira just to go ahead and remove them, but for Confluence, um, it, it doesn't uh, work out as well if you remove the author of the content. Things can get disassociated. It's harder to find things. Uh, so you may just want to be careful there. Uh, custom field usage. Uh, maybe you have all these um, custom fields that aren't being used. So, so why bring them over? Uh, and then 
unused workflows, schemes, and, and so on and so forth. One of the problems with this is you can't just collect it even a, a week prior of the migration because within that week, everything's going to change. You need to be able to collect it very quickly. Uh, as soon as you, you have to start collecting it after access is removed prior to the migration beginning. And to do these things manually could take you 30, 45 minutes uh, logging into the database and running all these uh, uh, SQL queries manually, uh, which isn't a whole lot of time, but it, uh, you are dealing with a restricted window of time for that migration of when you've told users it's supposed to be back up. And every minute you spend just, just running these queries is time lost uh, in that bigger window. And here is one area where automation really can help. Uh, and this is a, a solution. It's not a product, it's a solution that we've created and it's called Health Reports. And it uses the simple issue language that I've introduced earlier. Uh, and it's just a bunch of scripts that we've gone ahead and written and we've actually put in a public Bitbucket repository and anybody can download and install. And you push a button and they go out and they, they run all these reports for you and they collect all this information for you and all in about 30 seconds. And it's all the same information that you'd want to collect uh, prior to migration. In fact, some of it is written specifically for that purpose. Uh, the next step in Caviar is, is V for, for verify. Um, how do you know that a migration was successful or not? Uh, just because all the elements that you think were supposed to be moved got moved doesn't necessarily mean things are working quite the same way. There are fundamental differences in, um, in cloud and server, one of which being GDPR, uh, where users can be completely anonymized. And if you have um, certain settings and configurations uh, based on users' names, you know, this is mostly done with, with uh, third-party add-ons, not necessarily um, Cordier itself. Um, those may not always work 100% of the time in, in cloud because uh, users can set whether or not they want their, their names or their emails uh, publicly visible or not. So there can be a lot of other areas where, where things just don't work the same. So you want to develop a, a test plan. You want to uh, determine who's going to be testing the success of the migration. And you want to make sure you include members from each business unit using the system to be part of, of that group. And each group wants to determine the, ess the essential functions for their individual group. And you want to communicate to that testing team uh, when testing will begin and how they should record the results and what to do in the event uh, an error is discovered prior to migration. Then you want to compare the results. Um, use some predefined test cases and compare the results from your testing in server with your testing in cloud. Um, and there are some tricks to using uh, test cases. One is you can create test projects and issues and users in the self-hosted instance. So when the migration occurs, they automatically appear in cloud, and then you can just run your tests on those. You don't have to spend any more time setting them up. You've already run through them a couple times on the server, so they're the way they need to be. And you can actually automate these tests because there could be quite a few. Uh, you could use uh, automation like, like Power Scripts to run the actions within JIRA that would identify the problems that could um, be a result of the migration. Um, the next section is called Integrate. And it is uh, no, in no way added just because uh, I needed an I to, to make the word caviar. I promise you that. 
Um, and that being said, please be in, in all of my, my beautiful graphics and uh, not my, my weak content on this section. Um, so when I'm talking about integrate, uh, integrating, I'm talking about more than integrating with uh, systems. Uh, I am, of course, talking about integrating with systems, um, or it is included, but it is not specifically to integrating to your external systems, using automation to integrate the same way you would with, with server, but perhaps you, you need to use different uh, means in cloud, such as uh, Slack or Ops Genie, um, services like that. But more so than just integrating with services, uh, integrating with tools. Um, so Atlassian does have a migration assistant that many, um, many third-party add-ons are working to become integrated with. But Atlassian partners also have built tools themselves to assist with migrations. So there may be more avenues or more tools out there that um, you're just not necessarily aware of. So integrating with experience, and that includes uh, Atlassian, um, is definitely a good idea. Uh, like I said, I am going through a migration on, on my peer instance, and Atlassian is absolutely helping me with this every step of the way. And again, focus on the graphics. Okay. Uh, now we come to automate and synchronize, uh, very strong part of, of the CAVIAR acronym. So the benefits of automation, again, we all know that uh, with automation comes efficiency, flexibility, and speed. Now, automation can do many things within JIRA. Uh, it, it can read issues, it can restrict issues being created or transitioned, it can manipulate the, the UI on, on, on the server anyway, it can manipulate fields, uh, you can enhance your jQuery uh, reporting, you can create autom automated prioritization and just you know a plethora of things you can do with, with automation. Um, One of the things that I'm implementing or, or talking about implementing um, is, is this concept of um, a dual system. So I have customers who are working within my, my server hosted instance and I'm going to migrate my JIRA to cloud, but I don't necessarily want to give them uh, a bad experience by by migrating the midstream. Uh, one possibility is to create the production environment, do the migration. You can do it on a Tuesday, for example, and then implement this synchronization where all the activity from system A automatically gets pushed to system B. And then you can take your time and test the new system and verify that everything's working correctly and all the while being ensured that this, this data, these changes from system A are making their way in to system B. And you don't necessarily need to go back and do the migration again. All you need to do is verify that things are now working. And then at your convenience, you can flip the switch and people will stop using system A and they'll start using system B. And this is one of the things uh, that I, I am planning on doing with, with my migration. And uh, Atlassian was very bewildered by this. Um, they had not encountered something like this before, uh, mainly because of what they perceived as the level of effort setting it up and the complexity of setting it up. Um, and my response to them, well, you know, I, I do this all day for people. And it's actually very simple and can be done uh, in a very short period of time. So why not do it? Why not get the best of both worlds? Uh, you know, why not have side-by-side -side testing, parallel testing? Why not uh, uh, have the convenience of maybe switching over half the users first? 
and then letting the other users finish up finishing up in the old system before they they migrate them so something uh something to think about all right uh repair clean and improve this is where uh usually i get called into automations lots of things unforeseen things can go wrong lots of gotchas and this is really where experience uh helps because these some of these incidents were with Atlassian's help and just things that nobody anticipated. Uh, one example is dates. There was uh, an organization I was helping with the migration. They were very, very dependent on due dates. And some combination of, of the time zone of the server they exported the data from and the time zone of the cloud server they imported the data into caused the dates to um, be one day off. I don't remember which particular direction they were off, but every single date in Jira was off by one day. And they didn't have time to, to redo the import completely and, and fix it in the XML. Uh, they were live, they needed to stay live. So uh, it was actually a very simple thing to do, to just go in and and move the dates back by one uh, at least for the due date so you don't necessarily need to redo the whole migration just because something went wrong you just need to fix the problem uh, worst case scenario there's an entry in, in the history uh, of the issue that a change was made um, but as long as everybody's aware of why that's there there, there shouldn't be any problem uh, content added by add-ons so uh, another example was there was a third party add-on that created HTML markup tags in, in the description field. And of course this wasn't supported by cloud. So they needed a way to go in and strip all these tags out. And the traditional way of, of making these types of changes with the migration is to export the XML, modify the XML itself, and then do the import. Well, HTML tags and XML tags are very, very similar in how they're, they're tagged. Uh, and this can be extremely difficult to differentiate the XML tags from the HTML tags. So they had no good way of doing this. Um, so again, uh, this is something we repaired after the fact. And uh, I can't say it was easy but it was certainly a solution to a problem where they had no solution um, so a tool like this especially a simple tool like this uh, might be your your last resort in, in an automation problem uh, and then links um, i had uh it's just relatively recent uh, i had to help with migration where there was an acquisition of some sort and multiple cloud instances were combined. And the problem is that it wasn't as simple as replacing the URL in, in links. Um, the, there, a lot of the links had page IDs in them and the page IDs had all changed. And there was no good way to just say, this is what the new link needs to be. So I created uh, a solution that, that went in, found the links, and actually ran a search in the other systems, found the appropriate page, and then updated the linking. And again, that, that was a problem where they just didn't have any other solution. So, you know, again, don't think that just because the migration is done, your only solution is to start from scratch or live with it, because it's not. Uh, I do a lot of repairing. Uh, the next one is, is cleaning and improving. Um, cleanups prior to migration. Again, I, I hear it from a lot of people. They say, uh, I don't want to touch anything until after the migration. Well, there may be times where uh, there may be impediments to your migration that could be completely resolved by cleanups, like third-party add-ons that don't exist in cloud uh, that you think you're dependent on. Uh, and then if you go and start doing the research and removing projects and, and workflows and issues, 
um, you may find that those were the only ones actually using it in the first place. I did have that happen. Uh, so, you, you know, cleaning up your, your active user count, just keeping the back end of, of your clean by removing unused schemes, workflows, and custom fields. Removing old attachments is a possibility uh, to preserve, uh, you know, storage space for cloud if, if you don't have an account where, where that's unlimited. Uh, maybe just doing simple things like removing old comments from documentation that's five years old and no longer relevant. That's another example of, of things that people didn't want migrated that I went in and cleaned up for them. Uh, and other cleanups you might not think about. Um, you know, a lot of people just rely on the fact that their server instance is behind a firewall. And that is the, the first level of security on their JIRA instance. And I mean, it's almost good enough at that point where, where the next levels are just maybe between uh, uh, management and non-management. But in the cloud, you may realize that your security isn't quite where it needs to be. That's why everything migrated exactly as it was on server. Maybe now it's just not adequate in the cloud. And you need to loop through and, and, and make adjustments to projects. Uh, and I have customers who have so many projects in JIRA that they can't actually go into each project and make these changes manually. Uh, because they have, I think it's upwards of, of 5,000. Of course, it's very, very large company. Uh, so they actually need a tool like this to, to go in and make those changes for them because making them manually is just is too much. And, you know, just other improvements. Uh, remove users from spaces who don't belong there uh, or, or remove individual user permissions from spaces and replace with groups. That's just a good practice but you know there's always somebody who, who goes in and makes a mess of things um, bulk changing page labels so they're they're uh, more consistent and they follow a naming convention i mean if you have thousands of pages inside confluence and, and the labeling's done slightly different within each one going through each page manually might be impossible um, or highly improbable but to do so in bulk is, is um, actually not as much work as you would even think it is. Uh, it is definitely within uh, the realm of possibility. Okay, so this is uh, my JIRA instance. And you'll see the PowerScripts dashboard, uh, which allows me to run um, ad hoc scripts. And this is actually one of the solutions that I mentioned uh, I, I created for a client where you could actually paste CSV data out of Excel and the data would have, uh, for example, a project key and the username and a role. And it would use that data to identify where to add users to. Um, so I just thought I'd mention it because it was open. But what I wanted to show you is, uh, well, yes, I will show you. The simplicity of the language itself. So here I have a subtask with a key of TP104. And why that loads, I'm sorry, this is my local JIRA, it's a little slow. I'm gonna come in to the SIL manager, and this is where everything is done. And I'm gonna just create a very basic script. So in most instances, the script already knows which issue it's running for, and you don't have to tell it. I am going to tell it in this editor because it's not running from the issue. And here we can see the summary is subtask three, and for whatever reason. But you notice that I just wrote the word summary. Uh, and, and if this was coming from a post function or a workflow or validator or a listener, it would already know which issue you're referring to. 
And you, you, you can do things as simply say, give me the summary or give me the description. Okay, here we go. And you can see that that indeed was the summary. And so again, I can just say, give me the des description. And this is the description. Now, writing to these fields is just as easy. I'm going to run it. Nothing's going to appear down below because I didn't ask it to, to write anything out there. And I'm going to refresh this. Now you can see the word hello. So I can write just as easily. Uh, so imagine now if, if it's that easy to do things like this to update a date on a ticket. Like I mentioned, uh, um, I had to loop through all the issues in one cloud instance and move the date by one. Uh, which would look something uh, like this you know, by one day. It's one line of code. In fact, I can do absolutely everything in Jira with one line of code. Uh, if I wanted to transition an issue or add a comment, one line of code. And this is the actual syntax uh, of what you would use. So to transition is called auto transition. To add a comment, it's called add comment. So it's, it's very uh, intuitive and it's very simple to do. Um, and it's great for, like I said, getting information out of Jira that you might use for uh, purposes of the migration. Um, so for example, Here is a list of all the, the projects in Jira. Something wrong. Run our logs. All projects. Is a routine. So this is every single project in my Jira instance. Now I can just get it very quickly. Uh, otherwise, you might have been copying and pasting that into a CSV or getting it out of the database. Uh, I wanted to get active users, for example. Activate users. I'm just going to look that up. Get all users. There's every single user in Jira. Now, obviously, I only have six or seven. That's not a lot. But if you had thousands and you wanted to get a list of all those users, and if you wanted to get a list of their last login date, for example, uh, how would you even begin doing that? Uh, and as you can see, it takes me seconds in order to do that. And, and there is information I can get about that user um, you know, outside of this very easily. Their full name, their email, and I can even get their login activity, uh, user properties, information from LDAP, anything I want. It's, it's uh, that simple. So I did mention health reports. So this is how you would execute health reports. Um, like I said, health reports is available in a public repository and it provides you data information about your instance that you might not have any other way of seeing. I'll show you an example of that in just a second. Um, so here, here's a Bitbucket repository where you can find health reports uh, and, or here's a Bitbucket repository where you can find health reports. And what's neat about this is there is an installation script here where you just copy and paste this one script into that same SIL manager that I was using in the other screen, fill out some information about your JIR instance, and it'll actually go out to Bitbucket and download and install the rest of health reports for you. Uh, so you just have to do this one thing. But to execute health reports, you would just hit this run button here. Uh, you could schedule this, this script to run at any point at any point in time. 
But here's uh, an example of uh, a, what we call full health report run back in May on our C prime deer instance. And one of the things we try to do is come up with a score that lets you understand the health of your instance. And this page was actually created by this button here, um, but in the, in the actual C prime instance, not my local instance. Uh, the output of the report gets written to the com written to Confluence or email. So what's actually kind of cool is uh, using standard Confluence page report macros, you can keep track of the score in one table and you can see if the score is going up or down over time. Uh, but let me show you some of the content of uh, health reports. I'm obviously having internet issues. Uh, so you get an application and license report, tells you which add-ons are included in your system, uh, which JIRA or Atlassian applications, such as service desk, your software, how many licenses you have. Uh, these are the, again, the user installed add-ons, whether an update is available or not, whether it's expiring, uh, this is the system health report. It does a bunch of system health checks. If you fail one of these checks, such as free space on your, your uh, machine, uh, there'll be a link to the documentation where you can go out and you can figure out how to fix the problem. Um, and again, this is all in the spirit of getting things cleaned up prior to migration, so you're not migrating any of those problems along with you. Uh, but here's some great examples of things that you might not want to migrate. Uh, this is the integrity check. This was created by interviewing Jira admins and going out to uh, the Atlassian knowledge base and finding problems that you would only ever know existed if uh, you queried the database, and which people don't go out and do on a regular basis. So empty filters, a filter with no content can, can cause um, pages to crash, out of memory errors. Um, not something you want to leave laying around. Again, you wouldn't even know it's there. Um, null workflow statuses, duplicate epic story links, uh, and all these are actual problems that are within our dear instance uh, that we haven't gone in and fixed yet. Uh, so this is the administrative health report. This lets you know how many attachments, how many comments, how many components, basically a count of everything in your system great information to know prior and post migration. Uh, this is a list of all your JIRA administrators. Uh, last login activity, users who have been active in the past 30 days or, or uh, 60 days or 90 days. Custom field usage uh, uh, on a screen but doesn't have values. And then you can get a detailed list of the projects that that's on. Um, or custom field usage by project, you get a percentage wise. And we did come up with some arbitrary thresholds where we said, hey, if you're using this less than 60% of the time, maybe it's not really providing you the value that, that it, you know, a custom field really should be providing you. Um, and other unused elements such as uh, issue security screens, uh, we have quite a few of those. And again, if uh, the simple issue language can find all this information out about your system, um, obviously just because it's simple doesn't mean it, it, it's not powerful um, because it is extremely powerful yet extremely easy to use. All right. Well, we open it up to questions. Okay. Thank you very much. That was impressive. I have to say, because I haven't seen that in that short a time, in that structured form explained how to do it ever. So thank you for that. Um, we have one question and while I promote everybody to panelists, the first question is from Frank. Um, when it comes to add-ons which are not available in the cloud, do you have some script to remove traces of them? So I mean, if you can't uninstall it prior to migration. Uh, it depends on the add-on. 
Um, but the answer is yes. I mean, one example was the leftover HTML tags and the descriptions, and I think they were even in comments. Um, in that example, yes. Um, I mean, if it's a custom field, um, you could migrate the data out of that custom field into another custom field. Um, you may find that that data is no longer usable anymore. But if you wanted to know what it was, you know, for historical purposes, uh, you could just copy that data out into a, a static field. Um, thing, things like that. Um, is there a specific add-on that you had a question about or, or just in general? So you're all on the panel now. You can ask and answer directly. It was just in general. So, I mean, like we did some stuff like uh, copying uh, field values to descriptions and comments and stuff. But like um, sometimes when you have, uh, I'm not sure if time to SLA is there or something, but if you have something which like generates uh, a value when you visit uh, the issue directly and they are like not there and you just like want to keep that state just for noting. I mean, that could also relate in just like putting it into a comment. But like some sometimes uh, I, I stumbled upon like some add-ons which were like not directly cleaning themselves up when they were like uninstalled. So I even like saw ones where they uh, integrated into the core databases of Jira mm -hmm. and like killed the whole instance while uninstalling. So uh, I'm like uh, curious uh, of like cleaning traces up. Uh, but if you have like something, it's good. If not, then I'm like just curious. <laughs> so I, I, I've. You know, done a lot of investigating in in uh, um, the the world of of third party add-ons. Um, there, there's one thing I, I've tried to accomplish um, for a while now, and that's being able to report on the, the usage of third party add-ons, like how often they're used. And you know, in doing so, you know, I've just come to the conclusion that there are just so many add-ons, and they they all work so differently. Um, you know, there, there's uh, no answer, uh, <laughs> or it's like very hard to answer that. You know, uh, like you could use Google Analytics to track page usage. Uh, well, some add-ons don't don't have a page for configuration or something like that, and some add-ons don't bring custom fields. So it depends on the add-on. Um, what I can tell you uh, is is that with tools like this, and not not just this by itself, uh, you can integrate with add-ons using the, the REST API. And I mean, this wasn't true even three years ago, but now uh, I'm finding it more and more true that um, most add-ons are, are coming with REST APIs. Even if it's like a simple custom field add-on, they'll, they'll provide a REST API to read and, and set the value. Um, so that gives you a, a hook in, into that and to be able to extract the information and copy it into the description or copy it into another custom field. Um, I have done more database manipulation using these tools than I would like to admit because it's generally regarded as a, a dangerous practice. Um, but sometimes there's no way around it. Um, it has to be done. The, the, the danger is leaving it out there in the current state, um, not just, uh, you know, it, it's safer to clean it up. Um, and you can, can use these tools to work with the database and manipulate the data. Um, there's not always a benefit to using this tool to modifying the data directly because you can just do that in the database itself. Um, unless it's, um, looking up values like on a per issue basis, which might be harder to do. Um, like, you know, creating the, co the concept of a loop is much harder to, to do in, in a database. Um, and as long as you back up your database, that, that's fine. Um, 
And I mean, so, so those are the ways I've been able to interact with third party add ons. Some you get lucky and, and the way they're storing the data in JIRA is actually uh, pretty standard, like the way JIRA would store text. And maybe they're just storing, you know, JSON or XML in that text and you can reach in and, and grab the data out that way. Um, and then there's some add-ons which are, no matter how much time and energy I spend on them, they're just a complete mystery. <laughs> like tempo, tempo baffles me. Uh, um, you gave us some idea uh, to which scale you tested this, so 5,000 projects and larger customer. What's the biggest instance that you, that you tried this approach with and it worked? Um, well, the, I mean, that's the biggest instance I, I work with on a, a regular basis, but, uh, for data center certification, I had to create a million issues mm -hmm. in JIRA. And, um, so I, I wrote the script and it was like literally three lines of code and I ran it and my screen wouldn't refresh. <laughs> and I was like, well, <laughs> I broke it. <laughs> it was like, uh, it was, it was late on a, a, a Friday. And I was like, uh, it was, it was a test instance, you know, nothing, nothing I needed to worry about. And, but then I came back on Monday and there was a million issues and it, you know, probably ran for most of the weekend. Um, but it, it ran. Um, so I guess my point is it, it's, it's about time, um, especially with cloud and, and microservices. Uh, the microservices architecture in cloud does mean things can take a little bit longer because um, one, you know, uh, service gets triggered, which triggers another, which triggers another. So one action has to go through this loop before it gets complete. And sometimes it's fast and, and sometimes it's, it's not. So it, it's more about how long are you willing to wait because uh, so, some things could take a day to run against 100,000 issues. Um, so it's not an instant fix. Um, yeah, but you have to be patient because there's no clock running or this rotating circle that just it does it doesn't show progress basically well it just it, it, it does it does if you don't so completely overwhelm it like i did <laughs> where it, it, it used up all its own memory uh it, it can but um you know unfortunately it's if you needed something done faster on server, you might just take take down your server instance, make the modification on the database, bring it back up, and you know, yeah, you might have some downtime, but you're done um, within an hour. But that is not an option in cloud. You have no database access. Um, believe me, I've tried many times um you know we 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 talk to these um uh, you know lassian representatives who work with our company and they're like you know what what can we do to help you and i'm like you know give me database access to the cloud and like, yeah. <laughs> that's not happening uh so unfortunately it, it is uh it is what you're what you're left with okay okay so Maybe I have a question or let me rephrase it. I have a couple of questions because I'm the huge fan of uh, power scripts and I'm using that for the last couple of years. I have made hundreds of scripts, but I have a still couple of things that I would like to discuss because I have you so insider from C prime. All right. And I'm happy that you also acquired the company because I think that you developed much faster and I can see the progress of new functionality routines, especially new cloud version and so on. So let's start with something small uh, about updating routines for cloud because now you have only just information that some of the routines doesn't work, but it's not mentioned how it is. For example, I tried a couple of days before 
for some of my friends helping them out with checking the user data because that last and restricted due to GDPR data for users and the routines, routines were totally broken. And I helped them out with fixing that. And of course I need to do that manually, like trying if it works or not and finding by myself, like shooting the blind shots. But I did that at the end of the day, but it took me like a lot of time for finding how to get the information about users and so on, because it's only mentioned on the documentation that it might not work. So, so I'm wondering if you will update the documentation. So that's a fast question. Uh, well, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to split out the documentation for server and cloud. <laughs> Perfect. That was the answer that I was looking for. Thanks. Okay. Uh, <laughs> cool. Cool. Yeah, I'm actually uh, pretty close to doing that. Um, and I'm not quite sure I understand the nature of your problem, but uh, w one of the, the challenges we... Okay. we so with... for example, I will give you a simple example. Get full username, a routine, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And you need to, if you specify email, it doesn't work. You need to specify, I think, searching for name or surname, something like that. Well... Okay. So that, yeah, because I mean, they, that 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 yeah. should work. But I will say, um, with GDPR, if you request from the Atlassian API information about a user, you're not allowed to see. You get nothing. I mean, it's um, you know, it doesn't say you can't see it. It's just. Um, so you know the problem with with doing things with users in cloud is is you never know you just never know so you have to use a user id for example rather than the name and email and but of course that's not the way people want to write the business logic you know like we want to identify these people here's their name or, or here's their email uh or or these people with this email domain um do this and, and of course uh you just can't do it um so i mean it might be multiple issues going on one just might be the data availability one might be the actual uh routine um you know one of the challenges uh with cloud is, is just keeping up with the changes by lasting uh which they roll out weekly and and uh unannounced <laughs> They yeah, announced that they changed yeah, everything. I they totally don't. agree with you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, could, if you will upgrade, uh, update the documentation or split mm -hmm. it, it's perfect. Uh, okay, second question. Uh, so, we are using, of course, PowerScript inside eBay. So, so we have plenty of scripts. And one of the issues that we have is handling the credentials inside the script, for example, to Viki. So, I know that you can make a permanent variable yeah but then you don't have an access to easily see what's there and so on and also if i'm right it's not encrypted in database i wanted to check once but i forgot to do that finally so, i think it's yeah. not encrypted right I, in database then i've had a lot of debates about this <laughs> uh because there are encryption routines but the encryption routines require a key to decrypt so then where's the key live and if you have access to the key, why not just <laughs> have access to the password? Um, so we, we tried to solve this and uh, two, two improvements that are on the roadmap. One is a user interface for persistent variables. So you can see what they are. Uh, um, you know, we have um, different contexts for per uh, persistent variables. So you have global, which I use 90% of the time and uh, issue. Um, so you might not be able to see, this is what the value is for the issues uh, in, in, in the, uh, the user interface. Um, but there's no reason you couldn't for the, for the global issues. Uh, so that is on the roadmap. Um, we are a, a year into a complete redesign of the, the user interface. Um, so we're consolidating and improving the, the admin pages. Um, we're lots of improvements on the SIL manager, including Git integration and uh, contextual documentation hints. Um, and, and, and the persistent variable admin uh, uh, page is one of them. And we talked about the only solution we're gonna have for the, the credentials to be 
really honestly secure uh, would be to have a, a, a separate section in the admin where you could create these credentials and once you create them, they would never be visible to anybody. Ever again. Like in um, Jenkins, for example, right? Like what? Like in Jenkins. So you have a special section for credentials and you fetch the credential from the accession. That's my understanding, right? Yeah. yeah. Cool, that's perfect. So, uh, oh, so you already started to answer to my third question, which is the most important about Git integration because it's extremely pain in the ass to keeping up to date with repository because you need to copy paste and then push because as far as I know, there is no option to just push to your repo directly from PowerScript. So you can write a script to do that, actually. Um, I have scripts that do that. Um, because the, the scripts just live in a folder out on the server, even on cloud. I mean, it's just a regular file server on, on cloud. So you can have Git repositories there as well. Um, but for example, um, kind of like this is one that I, I made myself. Uh, where I can specify the folders or files that change and then write a message and uh, it would commit. Now it's always going to be pointing to the same branch unless I made a different file. And then on the, the uh, uh, test and production servers, I had a similar button that was just to, to pull. So only, only this one had the ability to, to push and the other two just, just pulled it down once it got merged and, and was... Uh... But again, the problem with credentials, right? So can I push it as Hubert could then to the yeah. Git? And yeah. then I need to store my private key there? So it, it would be, I mean, what, what I actually do is I go in to the, uh, the JIRA server and, and set up that connection the same way you would with any git repo and i just make it live in the sill manager folder so the ssh keys all are user properties of the git user and that's all at the the system level uh, cool so you have like a service account basically you know to your yeah cool and so ultimately um you know, we're going to have something like that for the the sill manager itself and then you know it'll probably work in very much the same way but you can push and pull just by pushing buttons okay cool okay mm -hmm. okay that's all my questions because except of that it's perfect so that's only my pain points and something that i was interested in perfect cool keep it going <laughs> yeah. hey I like it too. Uh, the the only thing which which I sometimes stumble upon is like when I switch to another script, and I uh, just like created another script. So I uh, sometimes I lose <laughs> what I just like wrote. Um, <laughs> yeah, but that's just the user problem. But the rest is great. I like it. So I think one more thing. So I know that, for example, I tried. And I did, I have to delete half of the instance tickets, like 500,000. And I think you can run in parallel a couple of the same scripts, which mm -hmm. can down the instance <laughs> pretty well, <laughs> because there is no option to even kill the running process, right? No, no there is, there is. It's, there uh, is. It okay. lives in a weird spot, but it, there is. It's under SIL diagnostic page. Ah, okay. So I didn't know that. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and of course, you know, whenever you go look there, you're not running a script. And um, let's see, I'm trying to open it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's, this is going to move in, in the redesign. Um, but it's, uh, it's saying careful with that ax Eugene, which refer, it's actually a, a lyric to a song. I forget which one. Um, so this is where the executions would, would be, um, depending on what's going on. Uh, I'd say this is safe nine times out of 10. You know, if the script is just stuck and it's waiting, go ahead and, and kill it. 
However, if Jira is still actively working with that script and you kill it, it, it can be bad for Jira. Yeah, yeah, I see. And I did, for the example, for when I deleted like 500,000 tickets, I split it that to, I think, 10,000 band. Uh, batches and then I did that and the progress was just a uh, logging right so one of 10,000 two of 10,000 writing in that log console that's it that's how I did that yeah I and, and that's how I do it too um, just because if you need to restart then at least you know which chunk it failed in and sometimes what I'll do is I'll make a scheduler routine that takes uh, parameters where I can pass like blocks of issues as the parameters maybe even schedule them like a half an hour apart uh, because there are routines to set up those. those. Uh, yeah, I remember that I used ones that you can even point to REST API from Python scripts or wherever. For example, I had an issue that I need to re-index some tickets because yeah. they get stuck or out of the workflow, whatever. And I go, could do that with the Python scripts that fetching from logs which key is broken and then passing that key to the script or through the API and then the script run the re-index routine. Because you, you don't have API from Atlassian for re-index one issue, but for example, power script does. That's that's pretty neat. <laughs> Actually <laughs> I love I love talking to people and seeing how they, they use it because nobody uses it the same way. Everybody has different problems and comes up with different solutions. Yeah, so for example, I already created, I remember tickets to, uh, to your support about improving the LDAP configuration because it doesn't allow all the protocols to connect to LDAP. So it's a configuration is totally different what you have, for example, inside Jira. And if you compare, you are lacking some parameters that it's required for connection. But then I redesigned the, the stuff there, I remember. No, I, I changed PowerScript to just Python, I think. Well, hey, and if you have anything else, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, like I said, I, I have to restrain myself because I, I, I love talking about this stuff. I have to like, say, all right, dial it, dial it back. <laughs> same here, same here. <laughs> I was afraid when C Prime was quiet, but then I, I, I can say that I'm pretty happy about that. Thank you again, Jonathan. That was very educational. Um, and you made Hubert happy, which is a good thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. thanks. <laughs> um, and yeah, thank you again. Um, have a good day, and hope to see you soon somewhere in the real. And uh, yeah, thank you, and good evening.